just to give you an idea of my own background. So um, I started out in plasma physics, then became um, a laser scientist, then an atomic physicist, then started to do applications in molecular dynamics, then in materials physics, then in mechanical physics, and now, as uh, Henry says, you know, we sort of, I work with my husband, Henry Kaptein, whose mom and dad are Dutch, so we have a lot of connections to the Netherlands. Um, but, uh, you know, essentially, laser scientists, often we go to where the application is, and as a result, we know a little bit about many broad topics in physics. And today I'd like to give you a sort of a 40,000 foot picture of um, the, uh, you know, what can we gain by being able to manipulate matter, and in particular atoms, um, on the time scale that's characteristic of that of the electron, so an, an orbit time, if we believe, uh, the, the simple idea of a Bohr orbit, that's about 150 attoseconds, or yeah. an order of a tenth of a femtoseconds. And then the question is, is there anything is of real consequence that we can do by this ability? And I hope to be able to convince you that indeed there is. And it lets us do generate a capability that we don't currently have. Uh, for those of you who don't do uh, laser science um, for a living, uh, uh, you might or might not uh, know that when the laser was first demonstrated um, by Mayman and Shallow and, and uh, those pioneers, um, it was called a you know, solution looking for a problem. They had absolutely no idea what new capabilities would be possible because you had this directed beam as opposed to this incoherent um, Black, black body emission. Uh, and of course now we know that you know, lasers power the internet, um, are used in manufacturing, welding, um, just uh, science, uh, communications, just so many different exam examples. Of, they have a huge impact on our society, on new generations of eye surgery, so many different applications. But um, that, that, that potential was not real, um, understood initially at all. And I don't know, so if, uh, so this, uh, the 50th anniversary of the first demonstration of the laser was back in 2010. So the laser is about uh, 56 years old or so. And I don't know if anybody knows what is the shortest wavelength laser that people use you know, practically. Anybody? Thirteen nanometers. So, is that? Do you know? Is that a laser, or is it a light source? Uh, yeah, not really. So, so Simer makes the illumination for the it's SML stemmers, and it is a laser plasma source, and that essentially is a. Uh, bright light bulb. In fact, they try very hard to have no coherence, because if there's any coherence, then when they try and print the circuits, you get interferences. So you want it as incoherent as possible. OK, so let's have another guess. So does anybody, do anybody want to have a guess? Uh, what, so in 56 years, you would think there would be a fair amount of progress. If I ask you in terms of magnetic data storage or in computing power in our computers that were not available 56 years ago. So anyone pick a number? Okay. Or get, get it right to an order of magnitude. Can I include excimers? Of course you can include excimers. Yes, yeah, so 193 or whatever. You are absolutely right. So the first laser was demonstrated 694 nanometer when Maiman demonstrated the ruby laser. It's a really beautiful material. You know, chromium and sapphire. And in 55 or 56 years, uh, essentially have decreased that wavelength by less than a factor of four. Um, and so what I'll try and talk about today is, you know, a, a way to fix that situation. Because um, in, you know, the ability to control light is very useful. We've seen we've seen that from all the application of visible lasers, and all of those could be transferred directly 
to shorter wavelength lasers. But it turns out until now, before we understood how to really command quantum physics in a very strong way, we just didn't have a way to do it. Okay, so um, of course we have x-ray sources that are in widespread use. Whenever you go to your doctor or your dentist's office, it's easy to take an x-ray and your radiologist or your the technician will look at the x-ray and I don't know if it has ever struck you, but it is a little strange that the this blur they will look at um, in the x-ray film is actually not a whole lot crisper than the original x-ray picture that Runcan took of his wife's hand. It doesn't really look a whole lot better. And in fact, the x-ray tube is still the same technology, you know, well over a hundred years later. And essentially, one of the reasons that that image is not crisper is essentially you're taking a picture with an x-ray light bulb. So you don't have the focusability or the directed nature of <coughs> a laser-like beam that's okay. coherent. And uh, so you might say, well, why not? And so instead of using this um, x-ray tube, which is essentially, you know, pointing electrons off a filament, having them slow down when they hit uh, the target and emit incoherent bremsstrahlung, which is just <coughs> essentially mimics a hot black body radiation uh, to a first approximation, why not use an x-ray laser? Well, people did try to do that, um, but they very and they started almost immediately after the visible laser was first demonstrated. Uh, but they ran into um, a significant challenge, and the challenge is that we know what the ratio is of spontaneous emission to stimulated emission. So, in other words, you heat something up, like in a plasma in the sun, you make a lot of excited states. If an atom is in a very highly excited state, will that atom tend to decay faster or slower than if in a gently excited state? What do you think? Those of you who might remember your atomic physics, but just in case you've forgotten, just guess. If, if it's a very highly excited state, will it, will it uh, decay faster or slower? Faster, exactly. So it turns out, to make a population inversion, you need lots of atoms in an excited state, so when one decays, it stimulates other to, to decay, and that's how we get our laser beam. But if you have a situation that what you're looking for is a highly excited state because you want to make an X-ray laser, so you have to have a really high energy transition, it's very, very hard to get enough of them up in the excited state because they all want to decay very quickly. And you can do a back of the envelope calculation and prove to yourself that the power needed to power the X-ray laser goes as the wavelength of that laser to the inverse fifth power. And that, it turns out, is awful as a scaling law. Because what it means is that I can hold a laser pointer in my hand that's point, you know, powered off batteries because it's in the visible. <coughs> But if I want a nanometer wavelength laser as opposed to a green, instead of a milliwatt, it would need a terawatt. That's about the entire electrical generating capacity of the United States. So you will never make a continuous wave X-ray laser. Just not going to happen. And if you want a one angstrom laser, it would take a terawatt. So you can sustain these powers for very short times, but not for long times. And that's for that reason that back in the 1980s, before any of you were born, I'm guessing, um, that uh, in the uh, Ronald Reagan in the Star Wars era, uh, some scientists proposed detonating a nuclear weapon in space and uh, using that to make a directed um, X-ray beam that could shoot down. Uh, missiles. Uh, fortunately, that was not scaled and put into practice um, in a big way. But it's this is also what it gives you the idea of the power you need to make a powerful enough X-ray laser to do something. And it's exactly for that power scaling reason that the first um, 
coherent Detroit being was not based on a population inversion, not based on the standard way that we make visible lasers, um, but rather based on an electron accelerator. Um, it was based on what's called an X-ray free electron laser, where one uh, very precisely manipulates very energetic um, electron beams and forces them to uh, emit light in a coherent way. That's a whole other lecture. But what I wanted it to say about it is, it's an amazing machine. It can make uh, millijoules of coherent um, X-ray bursts at about 100 hertz repetition rate. Um, this is the electron accelerator. It's about two miles long. This is the freeway interchange near SLAP at Stanford, which is where this laser was first built and um, saw first light in 2009. And, uh, it, as luck would have it, 2009 was, was just before the 2010 anniversary of the actual visible laser. And, and Stephen Chu was Secretary of Energy in the US at the time. And so we were having all these celebrations of the laser. So one of these celebrations, Stephen Chu said, these are marvelous machines, but you know they are not free. And I should know it because, of course, he paid for the budget to um, you know, to develop some of these lasers, and uh, the price tab is on order of one to two billion dollars. So there, there is these machines are fantastic, but their user facilities, um, they're really not um, feasible uh, for medical, routine medical or um, industrial um, applications. So we have to think about using a different approach. Um, but it turns out what I'll try and tell you in the next, um, uh, you know, 45 minutes or so, um, and please interrupt any time if I say something that, because these are, you know, informal master classes. Um, but we've gone from where it seemed like an impossible task to now where by combining laser science and quantum mechanics, <coughs> we can actually control light in the X-ray region in some ways better than we can in the visible. And that's a very kind of you know, remarkable place um, to have come to. And it's really over the past you know, five to 10 years, we've really begun to understand how much um, capability we have for manipulating um, a radiating quantum system. And I'll show you how we do that, where we can actually tailor the X-ray spectrum. We can go from a 12 octal supercontinuum, so it's the broadest coherent source that one can generate. It goes all the way from the ultraviolet into now the soft X-ray region above a kilovolt. Or we can make a single line. So, and this is using visible light to control X-ray light, which it turns out is really important because we have really lousy X-ray optics. I mean, you can make beautiful visible optics and polish them and have very low transmission, but we don't have that capability in the X-ray region. So it's really nice to be able to um, tailor the X-ray light by adjusting the visible laser that we're making it with. We can make linear or circular polarization. We can make ridiculously short, short pulses. I used to joke with my students that we got to think of a way to try and get, I don't know if you, um, for those of you, who might not be familiar with our jargon in our field. So a femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds, an attosecond is 10 to the minus 18 seconds, and a zeptosecond is 10 to the minus 21 seconds. And it's very clear now that we actually have control at the sub attosecond level, that we actually have that capability. None of us were actually looking for it. It's faster than any electron dynamics in any material. So but it turns out that this quantum mechanics works this way, so we get it for free. And I like the word Zepto. Yeah, I have a cat named Zepto. Okay, so how do we do this? So we use an extreme version of nonlinear optics. So nonlinear optics is what's happening here in my laser pointer. It turns out that most green lasers are infrared lasers with a crystal in front of it that adds two infrared photons and makes a green photon. Um, it's actually remarkable how fast nonlinear optics grew after we had laser light. So once Maiman developed the laser, then Franken, the year afterwards, took a ruby laser and focused it into a quartz crystal. 
drove the electrons nonlinearly and then used a prism to separate the fundamental blue, excuse me, red laser light from the blue light that was made by the electrons driven in uh, a nonlinear orbit. And I don't know if, if those of you know the story behind this uh, discovery. So um, the, at the time, back in the early 60s, you know, there was no CCD cameras, so they used a photographic plate to get an image of the fundamental and second harmonic, but they didn't know how to do this process very efficiently. So there was only a very small amount of, of blue light made, and the typesetter at Physical Review Letter thought the spot was a speck of dust and pited it out. <laughs> and, so, in the, and so you can look up now, there's actually, in that famous paper, there is no evidence of second harmonic generation in the paper. But um, Nicholas Blomberg had, um, talked about this at the APS Centennial, and what he was saying is that they never bothered publishing an erratum, because anybody with a new ruby laser, you could focus it onto a surface of a glass or anything, and you would get surface second harmonic generation. So every, and then you could see that with your eyes. So everybody believed the result, but they never bothered uh, correcting the mistake. And so that was the fundamental uh, laser light. And so now we know, of course, what's going on, that the black line here shows the laser field. And what's special about the laser field, it's much stronger in terms of the electric field you can you know, impose on a material than, than if you just take you know, light from a light bulb or the sun. So you can drive the electrons in an, an isotropic material. You can drive them in an anharmonic motion and then decompose that into its Fourier components. And in the re-radiated field, you'll get both the fundamental and the second one of the light. Um, and so you get the blue light by adding together the two infrared photons. Now, how many photons do you think you should be able to add together? If you try to take this to an extreme, anyone have a guess? There's no limit, right? There's well, that's the th interesting thing to think about. So how much power do you think you can put on that material? Do you think there's a, a limit? It'll melt. It'll melt, exactly. So there is a damage threshold, which anybody, and even with the CW laser, you can certainly damage things. Am I right? Yes. Sorry? For instance, the nice that we have a calcium chloride crystal. Exactly. So easily to I know, because it's hydroscopic. If you look at it the wrong way, it'll damage. I know. Yeah, exactly. So there is a there, there is a fundamental limit here, yeah. and for a long time that was thought to be about, maybe for 30 years people thought it was something about seven or nine um, uh, um, photons, and actually because you damage a material they were doing this in the gas, because it didn't matter if you blew the gas apart. <clears throat> um, and, but even if you could get to the seventh or ninth, um, the higher harmonics you would make, just like with sound were weaker and weaker. So you could make them, but not very well. Um, so it's a little bit like um, harmonics of sound. You, know, you think about a guitar string and you pluck it, and the fundamental will be strong, the second harmonic will, you, you know, depending on how you do things, and then if you pluck harder and harder, but what, eventually what will happen? If you keep plucking harder and harder? Break. Thing will break, exactly. Now what? Is there anything you could think of doing? I mean, what would you do uh, to try and still make it work? Do you think of anything you could think of, try to do? With your pluck? Would you do, would you do like that? Or would you do it like, you know? Okay. You do it quick, you do an impulse, all right? That's exactly what you do with the femtosecond laser. You try and sneak up on an atom and pluck the electrons really fast. And it turns out that, that it works. That's not how people were thinking when it was discovered, but in retrospect, we know there was a simple <coughs> analogy we could make. Um, and of course, so our little, our fast pluck is a 10 factor second light pulse. This is data just showing few optical cycles in duration, and we've had those now with enough power to, um, you only need a millijoule, it's not a lot of energy, 
But of course, since power is energy over time, if you can make a very short pulse, you don't need a lot of energy to have a power that gives you an electric field that's stronger than that that binds the electron to the atom. So that's easy to do with a quantum second laser. Um, it's really very, very easy. And as luck would have it, um, a, a couple of groups, one in Chicago and the other in France, used one of these new femtosecond lasers, and they, they were just becoming available in the late 80s, shunned this beam into a gas, and then in this uh, first paper um, saw something that people were not expecting. The highest harmonic of light observed was the 17th, and people just had no idea how this would, why, why you would see so many harmonics, and then soon afterwards, people saw more than a hundred harmonics, this picket fence. And do you notice something weird about, about this spectrum compared to what we were looking at before? That's right, exactly. They're not dropping off like we, in our intuition is for a perturbative process, right, or, or with sound. So, People knew immediately they were looking at some kind of new phenomena, and it turns out it's general. This any atom or molecule will do this. It's Henry likes to talk about it as one of the last fundamental things we learned about the hydrogen atom because atoms and molecules all respond to a strong laser field this way. The guys funding this work, which actually was funded under Star Wars, as as just to bring it back to that. Um, said, uh, it, it can't be that interesting, just ignore it. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, some other people took it up. And, uh, uh, and now we know that essentially it's this um, a high order harmonic generation. And one of the reasons people like it a lot, I think, is that it's very useful, but it's also a very beautiful quantum physics that has a beautiful classical analog. And so you can really study quantum physics, um, you know, it's very beautiful quantum physics, and then we can actually do useful things with it. So, okay, so you shine your femtosecond laser onto your atoms in a gas, and we said that you don't need much energy at all to be able to depress the Coulomb barrier. So the electron will start to tunnel, and then move away, but then of course the light field reverses, and so, the, your Coulomb field will do this every, um, anybody know what kind of timing this would really be? Hmm? Every femtosecond or so. It'll go like, oops, yeah. And, and this is periodic, this, okay, the electron will move away and be brought back because every femtosecond the laser field reverses. And this kinetic energy of oscillation, which you can just calculate from Newton's second law, law, can be converted into an entry. It's happening every femtosecond or so, and that's periodic emission in time. Do a Fourier transform in your head, and you're going to see a periodic emission. Increase. And that's your harmonics. So it's a very, you know, um, simple, um, relation and then it's easy to calculate what that cutoff is. It's just the maximum wriggle energy that you can give the electron. And it's got a gorgeous scaling law because look at that. It's proportional to the laser intensity multiplied by its wavelength squared. So if you want higher harmonics, just up your laser intensity or increase its wavelength. And that's just the one over omega squared dependence when you integrate, you know, the second law. So it's really gorgeous. Um, and for anybody, I, I, I won't go through the math, but just to show that it really is just integrating the second law. You have to know a few things like where is the electron born, but you can figure out that from, you know, a, a, a little, that it's born not at the core, but a little bit out, depending on how strong you feel it is. You know, but you can, all of that is calculable. And you can, you can calculate these beautiful trajectories. For example, so we can think through if the electron is liberated at the peak of the field, 
it's got maximal Coulomb displacement, but then it's born with zero velocity, it'll move out, come to a stop, and then move back, come to a stop, no energy, no kinetic energy. So the electrons that are born, the tunnel at the peak of the field are not the ones that give rise to harmonics. So then you calculate, well, if they're born a little bit after the peak in the light field, then they can move up and still come back with a lot of energy. And then some electrons, if they're born too late, actually never make it back to the ion. If they never can make it back, they can't recombine into the ground state and give up their energy. So in our field, you have, people will talk about these trajectories, and all that means is that the electron will follow a deterministic path, path depending on exactly when it tunnels. And from that, um, one can <clears throat> calculate all kinds of things. And since there's nobody here who's actually using the slide source, I leave out the details, but they'll be there and they're easy to, um, uh, uh, th 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 this is you know really um, straightforward. And we have a little bit of a, uh, a sort of a, a very easy, um, formula to plug in if you've got a certain laser intensity and wavelength squared this is just um, it's easy it's very very easy to have regal energies um, of 60 EV um, or more and that's how we can um, uh, and of course the you can give the electron slightly more than the average regal energy actually we can give it up to three times the average regal energy. And so if you give an electron a regal energy of 100 electron volts, then it's very easy to get a 300 EV at rate. And so this is really not at all anywhere near taxing our current laser technology. Any questions? Yes? I wonder how, like, when you talk about the, uh, okay, all these calculations, Yes. Okay, so it's all classical. Yeah. It's, all, it's all classical. So yes. once month the electron leaves, you assume it's just an electron and like Correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it gives it it lets you calculate the energy just fine. What it doesn't give you is the quantum phase. Uh, the quantum phase of so the now I'll show you of the of the electron, because the electron is traveling, but I'll show you a, a movie that will help uh, with that a little bit. But does the phase matter? If it's oh like it does matter. Yeah, it does matter. So, so I'll I'll get to that now. But I wanted to give the classical so the, the classically, it works great for calculating the energy. Yeah, but if energy, there will be like, as opposed to the Gaussian phase, there will be quantum, there must be some whatever, exponential tail or something. But it's not like the sharp cut, you know, that you have still some probability. Let me show you, let me show you. Ja! Here, exactly, yeah. So this is the poor electron in hydrogen, irradiated by a femtosecond laser field. So it starts out, in the ground state, and it's you know spherically symmetric, it's a 2D representation. The electron starts to tunnel, and do you see what happens that wave function? Now, under normal circumstances, if you were just gently driving the electron, um, like in a crystal, and with low intensity light, then your electron would follow a nice sinusoidal frequency and you would re-radiate the same color light. All right? Drive it a little harder. You could, especially if the crystal is anisotropic, the electromotion we talked about was now non-harmonic and you can radiate the second harmonic and maybe higher harmonic orders. Now, here, because we're taking the electron and putting it into the continuum, so this can be tens to hundred of angstroms, but do you see as your, can you um, see, can you do, do you remember what the radiation field is of a, um, of a arbitrary charge distribution? How would you calculate it? Yeah, so you would calculate, let's say, the acceleration squared? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's do you, right, exactly. Do you believe here that because of the spatial modulations on this wave function, that those frequencies are much higher than, so, so we're driving it at the fundamental frequency, but it looks as if you're doing this to the charge. So there, the, there is very, very high harmonics encoded on this quantum wave function. So essentially, it's a nanoscale quantum antenna. Kuichev back in, um, I forgot to put the reference here, but back in 86, 
uh, Khrushchev um, first proposed this. He didn't get every single part of the math right, but that essentially what you have is a nanoscale um, dipole quantum antenna, and that's what's really giving. That is the origin of the harmonics, and then the modulations of this wave function are related to the quantum phase that the electron acquires in the continuum and how that is different from the part of the electron wave function that didn't ionize. And so that quantum phase actually does very much matter and, and gives a lot of detail and um, about the nature of the field. So, so you're saying you're not ionizing completely, you're no. just taking out, out it's It's, no. you're radiating, this is your um, uh, the radiating electron wave function. You're, you're radiating as you're ionizing. It takes a, like three or four optical cycles to ionize. And during that, you have this nanoscale um, quantum dipole antenna. And you might say, well, but there's probably, any, probably hardly any light that comes out. And it is true, if you don't do it right, you don't get a lot. But it, oh yeah, so this is just the quantum picture again. So this is the, um, so, th th this is a, um, a nice um, uh, sort of a formulation by metric Lowenstein. So, the idea is so you've got a tunnel ionization going from the ground state in into the continuum, followed by propagation, where we calculate our phase <coughs> from the action and then recombines from the continuum back to the ground state. And so, so th and this is a dipole transition effect. And it turns out while the electron is in the continuum, it's a free electron. So a very small field radiated on that electron can allow you to manipulate the light. So it gives us a lot of control. And it's a coherent version of the action too. Because if you think about it, we start, it, you know, instead of boiling electrons out of the filament, we start with an electron in a quantum state. And then instead of elect, uh, accelerating the electrons in a static field, we accelerate it in a coherent laser field. And then instead of encountering an incoherent target, we have the electron interfere with a part of the wave function that's not ionized. So every step is quantum coherent. And that's how we get such a really good control over the light. So everything I told you was known back in, uh, by 1993. So, discovered in 87, the beautiful quantum physics was understood by the early to mid 90s, and there was some good correspondence between the beautiful quantum mechanical pictures that Ken Kuhlander, Magic Lorenstein, and others developed, and the beautiful semi-classical pictures that um, um, people developed. Uh, and so what's shown in these two um, little cartoons here are the sort of things you have to worry about if you want to make a real light source out of this. So what's shown in red is the laser field, and then this is the atom that the laser field is irradiating, and then what's shown in blue here are the harmonics that are being emitted while this atom is ionizing. <coughs> and I kind of, I, I know I'm asking a lot, but what do you think is the spatial pattern of this light that's being emitted? I kind of gave you a hint. There's a pulse. So what's the characteristic, you know, we said the emission was a particular type of emission. <clears throat> Antennas. Dipole, exactly. So, is that a beam? Yeah, that's a pretty much direct right call, no. Like yeah, it's but it's this out. big dipole pattern, all yeah, right? Yeah, no beam. Yeah, that's just like mm. excited, you know, atoms, all right? But you said it's coherent. It is, it is temporally coherent. You know when that will come out, but it's still not a beam. It's not spatially coherent. Okay. So to have spatial coherence, what you have to do. Oh, that's what the Exactly. Exactly. To get a beam, you have to phase match, and that's, you know, there's a beam coming out here, not because I have one poor electron, you know, in a, in a crystal. You have to have all the electrons in the crystal radiating in phase. 
Here, what you have to do is you've got to take all these atoms and make sure that the x-rays are all emitted so their crests are aligned spatially. Yeah? How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, you would think maybe, how hard could it be? <laughs> and that's what we all thought. And then about 20 years later, we figured, we finally figured it out. <laughs> so, so how hard could it be? So. Um, so here's your laser coming in, hits the atom, emits an x-ray. Now, does x-ray light or laser light travel, travel through a gas faster? X-ray light, yes. X-ray light, laser light. Who, who thinks x-ray? Who thinks laser? Who doesn't care? <laughs> Okay, maybe I'll ask it differently. Does red light or blue light travel through glass faster? Red. Red, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah, you know, the <coughs> Yeah, so, and in fact, does material bend x-rays? So what can you tell me about its speed, about the speed of x-rays? It's near one. It's near one. It's near C. Is that right? Because yeah, nothing, we don't have x-ray refractive lenses because they just go straight. So essentially, while you would love for the laser and x-ray to travel at the same speed, because if that happened easily, you would get the x-rays to interfere constructively very easily. And sure enough, you get quadratic in the field and you get phase matching. But you can't rely on that. Most of the time, the laser light's going through slow, too slow. And in fact, after you make a plasma, does anybody know about uh, what light does in a plasma? Does it speed up or, or slow down? There's a couple of plasma physics physicists here, right? So the x-rays still go straight through. So you don't have to worry about them. They always just do the same thing. They're just going straight through. But the visible light, will it speed up or slow down in the plasma? It turns out it speeds up. So, but then you've got the problem that the laser light, it starts out going through too slow, and then the minute you ionize, it goes too fast. So because of that, people thought there was no hope of phase matching. You just couldn't do it. Um, and uh, our collaborator, Carlos Hernandez Garcia, he's, he's, he works in Salamanca, the University of Salamanca, he's a theorist, and he made us this little cartoon that what you can sort of pretend is that the laser is like a quantum conductor, and directing a trillion atomic musicians, and you want the number of atoms equivalent to the number of people on the earth to sing in tune at the same time. Um, that's hard. It's also, <laughs> and not only that, but there's a huge difference in the laser wavelength and the x ray wavelength. So the laser wavelength is a, on order of, you know, near to mid infrared but your x-ray wavelength is one to 30 nanometers, and you've got to get the crest aligned to a much smaller fraction of the wavelength. Now, right? You, if you, what if you aligned the crest to half a wavelength? Would that help you? To a half a wavelength? Would that help? No, because that's exactly destructive interference. Yeah. So you have to have a much, you've got to have like a, an, or an order of a tenth of a nanometer, or an angstrom. And if you want to do it well, you'd like it better. So it turns out that you have to align all the X-ray bursts in phase with sub-angstrom spatial resolution, and it turns out sub attosecond temporal resolution, or you won't get a beam out. And of course, we don't have electronics that can do that. There is no way to, you know, to do this actively. But it turns out nature does it passively, and who knew? We just never knew. But it does. You know. And uh, so essentially what happens, so what, this is the laser pulse again, and this is the atom, and the green here is the electron, um, the ionization. The ionization is just going up to some small fraction of fully ionized, so this is not one. But the electron starts to tunnel near the peak of the field. Some of them return, that's why the electron density goes down. Some of the, one, some of the electron density recombines and gives you an x-ray. And so that's why you ionize the atom a bit, and then it, the electron, some of the wave packet recombines. And then you ionize again, and some recombines. So these are 
And on the leading edge, the laser is going too slow. The X-rays always are traveling at the speed of light. On the trailing edge, it's going too fast. So somewhere in the middle, it actually, all the X-rays being emitted during this cycle will add in phase because the, during that time, the laser light is going at a phase velocity given by the speed of light C. Sorry? The phase velocity. The phase, but not the group velocity. So the phase velocity of the laser is less than C because a glass, for example, or a gas slows down visible light in terms of its phase velocity. Plasma speeds up the phase velocity. So the phase velocity is greater than C, the group velocity is not. But phase velocity is what matters from the point of view of um, whether the X-ray phases that that are being made as that laser travels through the medium all are synchronized. And it turns out that the width of this window depends on the color of the driving laser. Sometimes it's very narrow, sometimes it's very wide, and we can control that. So we can control if there's a single electron recollision or if there's multiple electron recollisions. And because we're controlling the emission in time, that also lets us control the emission in frequency. Yes? It doesn't matter now that your pulse is getting shorter. Where is that? Yes, it, um, so it means that the rest of the light here you're not using, and so that's why again we like to use uh, an order of six cycle lasers, because you don't want to wait, if you have the laser pulse too long, um, you, you, this is just won't happen. You, know, you just waste all the energy. But what I mean is that it, it becomes shorter as it travels through the medium. Uh, it, okay, so what's shown here actually is um, our two um, uh, two traces for the laser, one at the beginning and one at the end of the medium. And what it's showing is that it's only during this half cycle that they stay synchronized. So that means all the x-rays generated during that half cycle are all um, corresponds to this half cycle moves at the phase velocity given by this speed of light. And so all the x-rays generated by that half cycle are perfectly synchronized. So it's a temporal um, phase matching. We're used to, it, it, for those of us who have ever tweaked a uh, second harmonic crystal, that's a spatial phase matching, where of course green light and red light will not go at the same speed through a normal material. But if you have a biorefinger material, you can align your green light along one axis or combination and the red light along the other. So you spatially tune their phase velocity. Here we're temporally tuning phase matching. And that's what the concept was so hard for us to figure out. In retrospect, it's easy, but we just, it was so foreign that people took a while. Yes. The control you talked about, is this uh, by the carrier ML phase? We, we don't need to do that in, in this case. There, there are, people started using that initially, but it turns out that phase matching, works kind of, it works on top of it, and so mm -hmm. it, it, the, the, this sort of tends to be very robust, independent of mm -hmm. the CP. Yeah. Okay. And so we have a, a very simple practical plot we can make that if this is the laser wavelength that you have available, you know, from the visible through the mid IR to, uh, to the, you know, tie sapphire and the mid IR, these lines show where we should be able to make bright X ray beams in the vacuum ultraviolet or the extreme ultraviolet or the soft X ray region. The dots are where we kind of confirmed these predictions um, experimentally. So it's. Um, <clears throat> Uh, a, a very sort of uh, simple uh, prediction, and essentially all that's happening is that you can't let the medium ionize too much or the laser goes too fast. But if you use a long wavelength laser, you don't need a lot of intensity. You don't need to ionize the material, the medium too much, and you can you can have the space matching um, supported. So that's why, as you go to longer laser wavelengths, you need less intensity and sure enough you can go from the extreme ultraviolet into the soft x-ray region and we actually don't know where that limit is. 
Uh, so, yeah, we do different color lasers into uh, high pressure waveguides, and then we get x ray beams that go from this is in the extreme ultraviolet region to a nanometer. Um, it's, uh, you know, about a KE protein <coughs> energy. And so that's why into the soft x ray region now. And this is the kind of spectra you get out. If you use a four micron laser, you get this. Um, 12 octave supercontinuum, and if you use a Thai sapphire laser, you get peaks, but they're so squished here just to put them on the same plot. Um, and this corresponds to a four micron laser, each photon is point, um, 0.3 of an EV, 0.03 EV is a four micron laser. Um, no, 0.3 EV. Okay. And so that means that by the time you get to a KEV, then you have 5,000 5, orders. So I we believe it's the highest order non-linear process we know of, and it's also the highest order phase match non-linear process we know of. And, you know, it's. Um, <clears throat> It's all based on quantum physics, so the microscopic nonlinearity is this modulated wave function that is um, giving rise to this very rapidly changing dipole radiation field. And uh, it turns out that we just when we thought we understood things, we realized that if you used a bright UV laser, you can get discrete peaks instead of a continuum. Um, that's a little bit technical for um, non-experts, but it was sort of funny um, in that, um, so, so essentially all, of, all that um, was happening, so this is the normal picture that I've just described to you, that um, you've got um, a laser propagating in a gently ionized gas, and you've got contributions due to neutral atoms and plasmas, um, and gently ionized, and the contributions are low, so you can make the laser and the x-rays, which are traveling at sea, match their phase velocity, so you get uh, a nice phase matching. It turns out, um, for intense ultraviolet light, um, the atoms and ions um, have a very high linear and nonlinear indices, and that slows the laser light down to where you can preserve phase matching. Um, at much higher intensities and much higher ionization levels than people um, believed. And so I, we, I'll move on a little bit here, but it, just showing that it's, it's possible. And we don't know where the limits are. Because what I actually, from the, the pictures I showed here, you can see that you have to, the, so this is uh, the quantum blob movie that we showed. That's you know 3D quantum propagation. Nobody can actually do that and couple it to Maxwell because essentially, if you wanted to predict well, where would the limit of this process be? You would like to do a 3D quantum propagation, and you would like to link time dependent Schrodinger to propagation of Maxwell's equations because you've got these you know very long wavelength drivers and these very short wavelength X-rays. But the problem is even to model a single cycle of a, let's say, a 20 micron driving laser, then if you wanted to model a one angstrom x-ray, and then you have to propagate it. So there is no supercomputer big enough to do this. So essentially that's why we don't know where the limit is, because it's not at all you know, clear what would the limiting physics be. Back in the envelope calculations, um, as you use a longer and longer wavelength driver, even if you don't have a very high uh, Lorentz drift due to the V cross B in the field, so even if your B field is low, your electron is spending a really long time out there. So it could easily miss the ion core. But it's also diffusion, quantum diffusion. And so you have to, so well, back in the envelope, say you should at least be able to get to 17 keV or 15 keV. I think our field will be very happy if we got that far. So we just have to see. But it's very interesting quantum dynamics as to see, you know, where would the limit of this process be? 
Okay, so this is a cool one. Um, <clears throat> and I know I'm going to finish in 10 minutes so we can get a little bit of a break and people can walk around because it's very hard to pay attention to physics, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> especially late at night. Okay. Okay, so this is a quantum movie again, which is our atom driven by a linearly polarized laser field. And this is what happens if you drive that same atom with a circularly polarized laser. So remember, in the circular polarized laser, your electric field is rotating. So do you think that electron will return to the parent atom? If you drive it with a circular polarized laser, will, it, will the atom ionize? Do you think? Who, who would think the atom might ionize? Okay. Who would think it wouldn't ionize? So, okay, so the, the ionizers win. Okay, so sure enough, the, you can, if you, if you um, irradiate your atom with the circularly polarized femtosecond laser, you will indeed, if you turn up the intensity enough, you will ionize the atom. It's hard. Sorry? But it's harder. It's harder, yes, but it will ionize, yes. So, now, so one? So you will have the emission for a circularly polarized laser. This is the question, this is what we're trying to get to. Okay. Yeah, because I calculated one for optics, uh, there was a uh, spin in the yeah. yeah. and then I see there would be a, a vortex. Yes, you can, so you can make the light, you know, you can pattern the light. But the question is here, mm -hmm. what is the one thing we have to do if we want to get an X-ray out? Actually, if you have the vortex space, then you can always get a phase emission in one direction. Okay, but, what, but even a simpler thing, if just one atom, so let's forget about phase matching, yeah. one atom. If I want to get in this coherent x out of that atom, what has to happen? Yeah. I got my electron, I give it a lot of energy. What does, what does it need to do to get me my coherent photon? It has to get back to the ion. Will it get back to the ion if I use a circularly polarized driving laser? <laughs> That's right. This is what happens. Yeah. So, no emission. So, it turns out for 20 years the experimentalists thought this. But there, but Wilhelm Becker, who, who um, had known for the same 20 years that yes, you could get circular polarized harmonics. And he was wondering, nobody saw the paper. So there was like two sites total. And then the experimentalists rediscovered it. He hadn't done phase matching. So, so the experimentalists did contribute something. But, but it turns out Wilhelm Becker had proposed back in 95 that what you do is you shine two counter-rotating lasers on your atom. And then this is what happens. So you're ionizing, but what is happening to the electron? It's going back. So you get the best of both worlds. <coughs> that counter-rotating, and in fact, if you do it in, the, in a spin fit, this is the um, combined electric field of the two counter-rotating lasers, and you get this nice three-fold uh, symmetric you know, combined field, um, but you can easily prove to yourself that it, you now have to conserve energy and photon spin angular momentum. And so can anybody tell me, and you're, you have a dipole transition, so can anybody tell me how many more blue photons can I grab than red photons? Do you all agree conservation of energy holds? So, you, so your X-ray photon is going to be the sum of the photons you use to make it. Does everybody agree on that? You have to conserve energy. Yeah. But now you also have to, you know, um, you, you also have to conserve photon spin and the momentum. All right, so how many more red photons can you grab than blue? One? Who thinks one? Who thinks two? Three? Okay, that's okay. So we got our three left circularly polarized. And now if I do two, just as a simple case, uh, right circuit polarized, then that's okay. And then that x-ray photon has to have the same 
polarization as the red. And you can do equally well one more blue and red. And so then you get a weird situation where your harmonic spectrum now, instead of having just odd order harmonics correspond to the frequency doubling because I've lifted, I get a, a burst every half cycle. Now I get a left circularly polarized harmonic, a right circularly polarized harmonic, and a missing order because it doesn't conserve photon spin and your plant. So that's the weirdest spectrum that you would ever see from a laser. You don't normally get anything like that, right? Um, and it's just very simple. You know, you just add up the number of photons, and you can only grab one, um, one more right than left circularly polarized light and it, there's a the, the, it's fun to work through the conservation of energy particularly if the colors are not condensed or the drivers are crazy for once we were writing one paper and there was about i don't know six people internationally and then we sort of you know, we were all confusing each other but um yeah so it, so it works and the, it turns out the phase matching is more simple because this is kind of cute because normally if you think about a light field, if you've got two different colors, they'll both travel at the same speed. Yes? Does it matter if you, um, what the phase is between Exa I'm just getting to that. I was going to show you. It's sort of cute. Because if, if you've got a two-color field, but they're made up of two different colors, the two colors will travel with slightly different phase velocity, so the shape of your field will change. And that makes it hard to phase match, because everything is changing as it propagates. Whereas in these trifold um, field, if your phase of the red and blue change, the actually the field just rotates. So phase matching is actually more robust. So it's one of those cute situations where not only could we generate circular polarized harmonics that we never thought we could, but it's actually easier to make them bright. So it was again upending our intuition, because the intuition wasn't based on actually a, a full understanding of the light science. And you can do this in the visible. That's if you use two different colors, you can get these beautiful trajectories um, and all kinds of, um, uh, for those of you who, who um, we can actually do um, X-ray magnetic circular dichroism now because we can um, actually uh, um, uh, generate circular polarized harmonics. And we can actually go further. So instead of having the light co-propagate, now we can put the light at an angle. And now you have an extra degree of freedom. You've got a spatial degree of freedom. And so now you can make all the left circular harmonics go in one direction and all the right circular harmonics go in the other direction. So we actually have a beam splitter now we can make that actually, a polarizer, let's say, that we, where we can direct the beams. And again, just using very simple, um, you know, angular momentum conservation rules. So it gets, um, yeah, quite crazy. Um, you all the different types of uh, the the geometries we can use and and uh, how we can split up our beam. Um, this is a nice way of showing. So you, you can do this with just one color laser. So now, if you've got right and left, you can you can see that each harmonic to make the next harmonic, you're going to have to need, um, you know five and three, so that now is going to tell you that every harmonic now is going to come out in a, at a different angle. So now it's like a spectrometer, except we're doing it with light and not with um, optics. Twisted light. Um, and then in the last three or four minutes, I was just going to talk about how would we measure any of this? How can, we, how can I convince you? I've shown you some nice pictures, I've shown you spectra, but I haven't actually shown you measuring the light pulse. So let me give you just a flavor of measuring the light pulse, and then when we come back at nine, I'll just give a couple of applications of how do you use these light sources to push imaging and time domain measurements to a very high precision. Um, okay, so um, if we have a picket fence in the frequency domain, we get a picket fence in the time domain. If we have a continuum in the frequency domain, 
we get a delta function at the time domain. Now, the measurement methods you use to confirm these really, you know, we have no perfect waveform synthesizer or measurer. Um, so you t tend to use different methods if you're trying to verify. So, of course, this is a simple spectrometer. This is not a simple spectrometer if you really want to prove you have a, a, a continuum because you need a really high spectral resolution, and in which case, um, if you want to show that your spectrum is real smooth, then in that case, you want to do a, a Fourier transform um, spectroscopy is the better way to go. It's just easier to do. And if you've got certainly polarized harmonics, your electric field is changing all over the place. So the traditional methods that we were using won't work either because your electric field is changing. So you've got another problem. But it turns out that one by one, we were able to solve them. And most of the techniques are, um, you know, we don't have a nonlinear crystal in the X-ray region, and the nonlinear susceptibility in the X-ray region is really, 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 really low. You can barely make a nonlinear response with an X-ray free electron laser. So instead, what we do is use the fact that if we shine, as we know from photo electron spectroscopies, if we shine short wavelength light on an, an atom or a solid or a molecular system, we liberate a photoelectron. And if you do that in the presence of a laser field, that you can simultaneously absorb or emit laser photons. So your photoelectron peaks appear. And these peaks are only present if the laser and x-ray pulse are overlapped in time. And then depending on whether you've got a series of bursts or a single pulse, you get a streaked spectrum is what people call that, or a dressed spectrum, just depending on whether you've got a single x-ray burst or multiple x-ray bursts. And that lets us do a cross-correlation. And uh, this is the Fourier transform I'll skip and um, instead show you, so how do we measure this circularly polarized burst? So the problem is that if we dress the spectrum, it'll work only for one of the orientations. And so what do you do? So what you can do is shine this light on a solid, and there's a, a real preference in the solid for photo emission for a particular polarization. You have, you have to pull the electron out of the solid. And so essentially, you can characterize one component at a time, and then, as we said, change the blue and red, rotate that field, this rotates the field we're shining on the solid, and then dress each component at a time. And that was the method we used then to measure. Uh, this is my last slide from this first part. What, this is the theory, this is the experiment, and we think that this is a tomographic reconstruction of a circular high harmonic, um, circularly polarized high harmonic light field. So it's an experimental reconstruction, and we think it's the most complex coherent light field that people have measured to date. Um, no, no application yet other than it's a crazy light field. But I'll actually give you an actual use <laughs> um, at uh, nine and talk about some applications in the Okay, so what I'll try and do in this talk is give you two examples of, so, so I hope I've convinced you you've got these very special quantum light sources. And now I'd like to show you that they're actually useful to do things, and I just picked two examples of imaging at the spatial resolution limit and making a time measurement near the time, uh, an ultimate time resolution limit. But before I do that, I wanted to um, just, get, again, sort of put the progress in our field, since you know, many of you don't go to the, our, the conferences in, in my area of physics. So Henry um, made this just for, uh, to encourage grad students that sometimes it takes a long time before a fundamental discovery goes anywhere. So for example, back in 1937, NMR was, was first predicted by Rabi and then immediately observed. And then they went on and did it, lots of spectroscopy. And in 1950, Erwin Hahn um, saw spin echo in NMR, which is the central concept for the MRI. And actually, Henry and I learned laser physics from Irvin Hahn at Berkeley, so that was nice to put, give his name. But then 
when the first varying commercial NMR spectrometer was in 1961 and the first um, MRI imaging was done in 1972 and the first commercial MRI machine was in 1980. So it can be 50 years, almost 50 years between when a fundamental discovery can give rise to an application. Now, some, some things are much faster, like graphene and such, but it's all over the place. So we never know. And in our area, it's a good example because it was an accidental discovery. It happens to be very fundamental quantum mechanics. We just didn't know because nobody had strong laser fields. And if you look at our area, it turns out that it's actually tracking. It's, it's going to be 15 year, 50 years before practical application, but actually um, I I Intel is interested in these light sources to, um, as metrology sources for uh, nanotechnology. And then just to, to also encourage you, um, sometimes you want to um, encounter some setbacks or difficulties during your PhD, and this is a picture from the internet of the first variant NMR spectrometer, and you might have seen this on, on certain in certain labs that warning this machine is subject to breakdown during periods of critical needs. There's a special circuit called a crisis detector that senses the operator's emotional state in terms of how desperate he or she is to use the machine. The crisis detector then creates a malfunction proportional to the desperation of the operator and threatening the machine only aggravates the situation. Yeah. And I think we've all, many of us who are close to our PhD would, uh, you know, empathize. It just won't work until you're about ready to throw it out the window and then it works and then you get your PhD. Um, and so, so this is what these light sources I've been talking about look like now. Um, you know, there really are, um, there's a big revolution in x-ray science happening right now. We've got the free electron lasers, there's high brightness synchrotron beams that although they're not intrinsically spatially coherent, you can still make a light bulb spatially coherent, provided you're willing to throw away most of the light. You just put a tiny pinhole and over the area you sample that beam, it will, you know, be a uniform wavefront. And so that essentially that's what synchrotrons can do. They can throw away most of the light, put small aperture, and then you get a very nice spatially coherent beam. It doesn't work for time compression, but it works for spatial coherence just fine. And this is what these little converters look like now. You take a femtosecond laser, feed it in one end, and there's some beam conditioning things. We call these our beam lines. Those of you who've ever visited a synchrotron, these are tiny compared to the whole thing would fit on that tabletop. So these are really our tabletop scale light sources. Of course, it took a while to get it to, to have be a nice engineered system. It started out much, very, very crude initially, but now it sort of is in a nice um, uh, you know, package so that it can be used by non-experts. So we have, so now I'm hoping you understand what I mean, that we have quantum control over x-ray light by manipulating the radiating electron wave function. Um, and I was discussing with some uh, students earlier, because tunneling is exponential in the light field, it goes as the intensity on order of the, to, to the 11th power. The, when the electron emerges and when it recollides is completely deterministic and synchronized to an incredible degree. And that's why the properties of this light are so precise. <clears throat> And so now we're being able to do um, more and more applications. And in every one of these, oh, thank you. <laughs> That's OK. We'll, we'll restart. In every one of these, In every one of these application areas, let's see if we have application area we do. <laughs> um, we learned something new about the materials because essentially we had a new probe to look at them. Um, and it was actually quite um, surprising to us because in many of them we would work with our collaborators and we'd say, can you give us a test sample, expecting to see nothing new 
but because we had a new way of probing the material, we, in every sing, single one of them we learned something new. Um, and in particular today I'll talk about two examples, um, how we can image with um, sub-wavelength spatial resolution, and that's the taking advantage of the spatial coherence of these light sources, the fact that they're a laser-like beam. And then if I have time, I'll tell you about the temporal coherence and how we can uh, measure and distinguish electron-electron interactions in solids. They're the one thing that happens on a sub-femtosecond time scale, and so we can actually look at them and, and sort of learn something about the materials now, um, now that we have these very short light pulses. And for all of these experiments, we have many, many um, collaborators um, in NIST, um, Peter Openier in Uppsala, our uh, Martin Nationals group in Kaiser Slaughter and, and the Schneider group in Ulick, and uh, just you know we, we we very much rely on collaborators as we go into new areas of science. Okay, so let me um, talk a little bit about imaging for about uh, twenty minutes. And X-rays are really nice for imaging nanoscale features because uh, we all know X-rays penetrate through visibly opla opaque materials. And it turns out that they have characteristic absorption edges that tell you what element you're looking at, what its oxidation state is, what its magnetic state is. And of course, their wavelength is very small, well matched to the nano world in length scales. And then in time scales, we can see the fastest motions in our national, nat natural world. We can make these pulses or pulse trains that are well below femtosecond, and that corresponds to faster than any material process. So we, we have lo more than enough time resolution. However, um, to make an X-ray microscope, there was a big problem. We had no good X-ray lenses. Um, you know, it's very easy to buy a really beautiful, you know, microscope objective in the visible. But in the X-ray region, since nothing bends light, you can't use a refractive optic. So you have to use a diffractive optic. It's what it's called. So it's like a, a diffraction grating curved around. This is called a, a zone plate that will partially focus the X-ray light but they're extremely difficult to make. The resolution is limited by how good a registration you have in, and how small the outer zone of the zone plate is. They cost about 50K, and they can disappear as you walk from one side of the lab to the other. They can just disintegrate. Um, and there's one place in the world that might be able to get a 13 nanometer spatial resolution, but most of the time, for regular people, you can only get 25 to 50 nanometer spatial resolution, and that's, you know, 50 times the diffraction limit. So, until very recently, there was no way to make an X-ray microscope that could achieve anywhere near diffraction limited rev rev resolution. And for the most point parts, it was five or six or ten times diffraction limited. So you couldn't take advantage of the short wavelength of the light. But fortunately, back in 52, there was a method proposed um, to get around this. And what David Sayer proposed was if you have a coherent beam of light and you shine it on an object, you could think about it as a cell, a biological cell, then um, and that cell was isolated, then the light would scatter onto your detector. Now we use CCD detectors. And normally in a microscope, you'd put a lens there, and the lens would refocus and take the Fourier transform, and you get an image. But if all you have, you don't have a lens, so instead you collect the amplitude of the scatter pattern. If you knew the phase, you could apply a Fourier transform and get the image. But you don't know the phase. But if your sample was isolated, at least you have a constraint, and that might help you guess the phase. So what you do is you take your amplitude of your scatter pattern, and you don't know the phase, but you can assign, assign a random phase, make a Fourier transform. And if your sample was isolated, here it was a J just for Jella, where I'm from, uh, you guess the phase wrong, so you get object out here, but you know the sample was isolated, so there should be no object there. So you just set those amplitudes to zero, 
and then take another Fourier transform, and then replace the experimental scattered amplitudes, your, your, re, re, replace the retrieved ones by your experimental ones, and how now you have a better guess of the phase. And you can go around the loop and eventually um, get what this is called a phase retrieval algorithm um, and, or, and coherent diffractive X-ray imaging. The big advantage in the X-ray region, it's the only way to get diffraction limited spatial resolution. Um, and it gives you a phase and amplitude image. It's robust to vibration, so you don't need um, any special vibration isolation, because all you've got to do, your pixel sizes are 13 microns, and all you have to make sure is that the light doesn't move from one pixel to another. And it's the most photon form, it, most photon efficient form of imaging, because there's no optics between your sample and your detector. Um, you can cry, okay? That is David Sayers' full paper from 1952. <laughs> Things were easier back then, yeah? And look at this. Can anybody read it? Who, who's close by? No, here. What, can you see what's in here? Yeah, the extension to the third dimension, to three dimensions is obvious. Can you imagine any of us getting away with writing that at the end of our paper? <laughs> and the other interesting thing about this, about David Sayer, is he was a co-author my, with my friend John Miao, who did the first 2D demonstration in 1999. Another example of why sometimes it takes a while. You have a great idea, but it takes a while for it, because they had no, it, so John took the uh, synchrotron beam at Brookhaven and, and narrowed it down. It was very weak, but he was able to show that the, the idea worked. So, and I told you about William Becker. So all these examples of these great ideas, and it just took a while to get used and, and become practical. Okay, so one problem though is for a long time, um, it just didn't look like the imaging technique. It took, a, it took until 2011 for the first reflection mode. So you know the idea of putting a sample in a microscope and you know looking at it just it took a long time before people believed the images because you know you had a, an algorithm guessing what your object was. So a lot of people said, I don't want an average of my object. I want to know what my object is. Of course, those of you who do imaging know that every imaging modality gives you a different view of the object, but. Um, but over time, th uh, things really have changed a lot, particularly since 2011. So before 2011, you, you needed this isolated um, object. And that's really a problem for a material system. You want to put the piece of material in your microscope and look at it. And if it had to be isolated, or if your beam had to be isolated or something, it was a real just experimental challenge to make the microscope. And what people did then was the algorithms were fairly simple. So what they would do is they would take 200 reconstruct independent reconstructions and average them. And that made a lot of people kind of not happy because, again, this idea, you don't want an average of your sample. You want your, an image of your sample. But now with this new technique called tychography, um, it, the, the problem is kind of overly over-constrained, and so now you can get a real image. So tychography, I'll show you a better picture here, where you take scatter patterns from regions that have significant overlap. And now the algorithm has to guess an illumination beam and an object that's consistent with a huge amount of redundant data. And it actually forces it to actually come up with the <coughs> image of the sample. And so, um, so now we've gone from imaging what, toy samples. This would be a fib holes, you know, in a nanostructure where all we're doing is imaging the holes. To now, this is an image of nanostructures on a silicon wafer, to where we can have sub wavelength imaging and we can do buried layer imaging. So let me go and give you a couple of examples of this. So this is what a tachographic microscope looks like. We take our high harmonics and we take a few 
mirrors to pick out one of them and then focus it on the sample and then collect the scatter pattern. And this is where we kind of really began to believe in this method because this is our coherent diffractive image phase image. And this is a scanning electron microscope image of the same structure, which are titanium nanostructures on a silicon wafer. And I, well, I hope you're able to see that we have a much higher contrast imaging than the SEM. Um, and that's not um, so surprising. The SEM is relying on the difference in electron reflectivities from different regions of the sample, whereas our uh, coherent diffractive image um, is, is the phase image relies on like a different depth in, you know, that the light travels through those very small scratches, but the wavelength of the light is very short. So that means we have a really high sensitivity to height variation. So our phase image is a little bit like an AFM, and our amplitude image is very like an SEM. So it's sort of a, um, a, a very in, a, a, a interesting imaging modality. And so we have really high contrast, very good spatial resolution, and very large working distances of 10 centimeter. And we don't introduce um, contamination on the sample. And that lets us make either height maps or compositional maps. This would be the phase image. This would be amplitude image. So a different color means there's different things on the sample. Um, the phase image you know, maps to height. Um, and then this is imaging through a buried metallic layer. Um, so we took some copper nanostructures, overlaid them with aluminum, and then we can take a picture, an image. If we take it through the aluminum, then we got this sort of surprising result because this is uncoated and this is coated. It's an amplitude image, so our contrast should have stayed the same. We should have had bright nanostructures on a dark background, but we ended up with dark nanostructures on a bright background. So something happened, the nanostructures, because we otherwise you should not see a change in contrast. Um, and so what we figured out is there was interdiffusion happening between the materials that were actually changing their composition. So it allowed us to see um, that there was actually some um, uh, material interdiffusion. And the, and the way we were able to confirm that is do an OJ sputter depth profile. In other words, a destructive measurement of the sample. So these um, X-ray microscopes allows you to, to see buried interfaces, which are very interesting for um, materials, um, photovoltaics or um, spintronic system. And then very recently, we were able to really push this technique and actually do the first sub-wavelength X-ray microscope. Um, it uses a lot of fancy algorithms um, and uh, lots of constra constraints, but they're very general. And so this is our best image so far. We have the scanning electron microscope image, and then we have uh, um, our coherent diffraction um, image. Periodic structures are hard for coherent diffractive imaging because there isn't a whole lot of um, uh, diversity in the scatter patterns because you get a very strong diffraction from the dominant periodicity. And so it turns out that if you can make an image of your periodic structure, everything else is easier. Um, but what it shows is um, with our um, fancy new algorithms here that we have a spatial resolution of 12.5 nanometers, which is 0.9 times the wavelength, um, which is the 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 first um, full field microscope in the event using any light source in the X-ray region that has very high um, spatial resolution. So in the last um, uh, yes. Ah, OK. It was a very simple one, actually. So it was a very good question, and it was very simple. Um, when you have a periodic sample, the algorithm tends to um, introduce crosstalk between the illumination. The, so the algorithm has, from all the overlapping areas, the algorithm has to guess the phase and amplitude of the illumination and the phase and amplitude of the object. And without a lot of diversity in the scatter patterns, because of the big 
periodicity superimposed the f fundamental periodicity it would have crosstalk between the probe and the object um, and so you can sort of see that um, <coughs> back here oops you could see that uh, there's a lot of extra fringes here that shouldn't be there but what we realize we can do is we can move the sample out of the way take a picture of the beam and force the modulus of the beam to be the actual measured one that takes out, out the crosstalk and it gets this beautiful reconstruction for the beam and the object without any crosstalk. Very simple. I, I mean already uh, step back maybe. Uh, sure. So uh, between this, I can't even Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Ah, yes, okay. So tychography, um, so if you isolate the object, then you can use um, the fact that, um, so you agree here is where we use the fact that the object is isolated to get a better guess, but the problem is it doesn't converge fast. And it can get stagnated and you can have slight differences if you run different phase retrieval algorithms. The tychography um, uses this idea that you, you have maybe 80% uh, overlap between adjacent scatter patterns. And now you run the tychographic phase retrieval algorithm has to guess an illumination and a sample that gives all of these multiple diffraction patterns with overlap. Exactly. So the scanning microscopy with 80% overlap. And now that is so overly constrained that uh, that works fine for non-periodic. Then for periodic, you don't have quite enough information. And so then you actually introduce the modulus of the probe. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And of course, you never know until you test. But we get, yeah. Uh, everybody is essentially moving to tychography now. The beam lines, the FELs, and the tabletop are all using tychographic current imaging now. Yeah. 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 Oh, the NA, the, numer the numerical aperture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but of course, for a traditional X-ray microscope, it's just the the fact that the op the optics are not perfect. <coughs> but here, there's no optics. It's just the algorithm, so it's just the NA the numerical aperture. So this is the spatial resolution in any microscope is given by the wavelength divided by twice the numerical aperture, where the numerical aperture is sine theta. Yes? Yeah, I have a question about the resolution. Yes. Yes. Ah, yeah, but that's, that's, that's um, so, so they take a mask and then demagnify, mm -hmm. and then they do multiple, yeah. Because, uh, yeah. They, they use kind of like multi-layer. Correct. Uh, multi -layer Correct. Yeah, yeah. Curved mirrors. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you can convert, you can focus. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the best 13 nanometer microscope, but, but printing is different from I imaging. Right, and so the best um, the, the best spatial resolution 13 nanometer microscope to our knowledge that was ever done before now has a 15 nanometer spatial resolution. They certainly uh, got to 13 nanometers using two nanometer X-ray light, but that's still six times diffraction limited. So this is the first sub wavelength. Yeah, yeah, it's. We're going to try. Yeah, yeah, we're going to try. We can go to lambda over two. You know, if you do an NA of one, the best you can do is lambda over two. But then you should be able to use super resolution. So all of this is possible. I mean, the light is super coherent. So it should be possible. How we don't know that yet, but we're going to try. <laughs> OK, so now we're doing super resolution in the time domain. OK, so I remember we saw this. But way back at the beginning, we had our 10 femtosecond visible laser. But now we have something a thousand times faster. If you've got a 12 octave supercontinuum, you can make an nanosecond burst. And 
you know, when people were trying to, this is when you, before you were born, and people made picosecond lasers and then femtosecond lasers, they started looking at faster and faster events, and they were able to do that by essentially making a faster and faster strobe light. But at some point, that same approach doesn't work. And one reason is um, that you know, the fractional bandwidth to support a 10 femtosecond pulse it, the bandwidth is about, if we can look at the uncertainty, this is the uncertainty principle in, its, in the electron volt femtosecond um, description, where delta E in electron volts multiplied by the pulse duration in femtosecond is 1. So if you want a 10 femtosecond light pulse, you only need 0.1 of an EV fractional bandwidth. And that means you can do atomic spectroscopy and molecular spectroscopy and material spectroscopy just fine. But if you try and use an attosecond burst, do you think you'll be able to do spectroscopy? Not easily. You might be able to do transient absorption, but you can't. Too broad. Exactly. It would be a, a KV bandwidth. So you can't do it that way. So you've got to figure out another way to do it. Now you can see well, what, what processes happen on a sub femtosecond time scale. And certainly there's charge transfer. Um, there's, this is a single optical cycle. Anything coupled to phonons is going to be slower. But there certainly is electron momentum redistribution, highly excited electron dynamics, and light science, where we're pushing the electrons around. So all these are real. So electron-electron interactions, strong field-driven processes, charge transfer, super excited states, all of those of real things happening on a sub femtosecond time scale. Of course, most things have, like if you take a magnetic material, everything's happening at the same time, and it's very complicated. So in our field for a while, at a second science, people thought you should use single at a second pulses. But it turns out that you get these very broad bandwidths, so then you can't make a band specific measurement. So it turns out, again, somewhat counterintuitively, that you're better off using these, what we call these pulse trains of attosecond pulses, because it turns out that it's not the same as taking a light pulse and making it shorter and shorter, because the harmonics are being emitted, you know, the electron tunnels at the peak and of the pulse, and then the electrons come back at a certain time later. And you get these very narrow bursts that are separated by bursts of light that are separated by a femtosecond. So if your dynamics are over within a femtosecond, it turns out that it, it's like as if you've got these really, really narrow bursts, but you preserve your uh, energy resolution so you can actually do, uh, you can take advantage of selection rules and, um, and angle resolve photo emission and actually look at what's happening in, the, in a material band and look at the electron dynamics. I know I've thrown a lot at you, so but let's see if it. Yes. So this is what I'm going to try and show you. So then you combine it. Good question. So you com oops, you combine it with angular resolved photo emission. And the nice thing about this. Um, high harmonics is that if you use a UV laser that's often done to get really high energy resolution, but then you really are probing near the band center. And in some of these charge density wave materials and such, you know, you really, it helps to be able to look at the band edge. And with either 21 EV or 42 EV, you can, you can map out the whole Berlin zone. But for a long time, because people needed to be able to look at, let's say, a band sp specific um, interaction, they, uh, we still didn't really take advantage of the attosecond nature. And, and we just made measurements with 10 femtosecond time resolution, looked at how fast a charge density wave material would melt its charge order. Or um, in spin resolved photo emission, you know, when you would look at a magnetic material and demagnetize it, what happens, those bends, you know, did the exchange collapse or what happened and seeing some very interesting things. But we realized more recently that we can actually use exactly the same setup 
and look at electron-electron interactions well below femtoseconds. So let me try and show you how we do that. OK. Do you remember how we measured the circularly polarized pulses? We shone the light on a material and added an infrared laser and looked at these side bends. So it turns out the interesting thing about these sidebands is if you could imagine these different harmonics, so these are all odd order harmonics, and you've got these interfering quantum pathways. Because uh, this harmonic might go from one band to, let's say, a free electron unoccupied final state. This harmonic might go from the same band to an excited state in the bulk. And these, the quantum pathway that corresponds to absorption of this harmonic plus an infrared photon interferes with the quantum pathway that corresponds to absorption of that harmonic minus an infrared photon. So now you can clock the arrival time of the two photoelectrons corresponding to those quantum pathways and see if there's a time difference. For this, it's a phase difference. So you just change the time delay of these two pulses with respect to each other and look at the fringes. See if you see a phase shift. And you do. You see these little phase shifts? So some are straight, some are bent. And the bent corresponds to an interfering quantum pathway. And the particular phenomena we were looking at in this first simple experiment was to look at photo emission that either went from an and uh, you know the below the Fermi level, so from some occupied band into a free electron final state, compared with one that went through an unoccupied excited state in the um, the bulk. The interesting thing about this unoccupied uh, final state is that there's such strong interactions of materials. It turns out that they are the shortest lifetime states that people know. Their lifetime is about 200 attoseconds, and we actually were able to measure that. People see it in synchrotrons all the time, but nobody was able to measure it in the time domain. But this was a great kind of way for us to be able to develop our method. And sure enough, so this is the time delay for photo emission. Off resonance, um, you measure zero time delay. On resonance, it goes to 200 attoseconds. Then off resonance, it goes to zero again. So it was very clear that we were we were measuring all the phases correctly. You know that. We were ascribing the right. Now, um, so having realized now that you know, if you want to look at now electron scattering, you want to go through free electron-like final states because you don't want to go into um, an excited, an, un an unoccupied excited state because they're the electron. That's a real state, so the electron stays around for a while, and it would mask any electron-electron interactions because it's a real state. So now. If we want to look at differences between electron, inter electron interactions in two different materials, we want to look away from any final state resonances. And so this is um, photo emission. This is in attoseconds, the photo emission lifetime on resonance and off resonance for two um, uh, metals, nickel and copper. Now. Here, this is not the surprising thing, because these are two, they're very similar st structurally. So not too surprising. They both have you know, resonances at about, this is a photon energy of about 25 eV. And they both have slightly different line widths to those resonances. So um, nickel has a 200 attosecond lifetime. Copper has a 300 attosecond lifetime. But we understand that physics now. What's more interesting was that there was a 100 as a second difference in time it takes to photoemit from the um, occupied um, bulk bands, the D bands, into a free electron-like final state. And we were not expecting that what would be the mechanism for this. And, and, and uh, if if you're talking about 100 attoseconds, it has nothing got to do with phonons. Now, you all agree on that, because you know phonon period is 100 femtoseconds. So this was three orders of magnitude faster. So it had to be an electron-electron interaction. And there's only two that you could think of, screening or scattering. 
All right. So either um, copper was screened more because screening will increase the lifetime, or the electrons in nickel are scattering more because scattering would decrease the lifetime. And so this is the little cartoon. You have an electron being photo emitted. If it sees a lot of scattering, the lifetime decreases. If it's screened, the lifetime would increase. And um, by comparing with free electron gas models and such, what we were able to show that with this free electron gas model fit copper beautifully. It doesn't fit it on resonance, it's not supposed to, but off resonance it fits it beautifully. Since this is a free electron gas model, then it sort of showed us that it, we weren't trying to explain then why copper was green more. It was more like why nickel electrons scatter more because copper agreed very well with the free electron gas model. And uh, then we realized um, if you look at the, um, the band structure in nickel versus copper, there's a you know, big difference due to the, um, s the spin split bands. And it turns out there's a lot more states to scatter into for electrons in nickel compared to electrons in copper. And so sure enough, because this is the Fermi level, there's a lot more unoccupied states for electrons to scatter into for nickel compared to for copper. And so essentially, this process is much more likely to happen in nickel than in copper. And so that's our little cartoon picture that in copper, you've got a full deep band. And so there's very little density of states to scatter into. So scattering is very um, uh, suppressed. But in a half-filled deep band in nickel, you can have a lot of scattering. Although we detect the unscattered electrons, it's a many-body wave function that's describing the whole electronic system. So we still see it as a phase delay or a uh, delay in the photoelectron uh, lifetime. And of course, um, you know, the, this is also related to the much more complicated Fermi surface for uh, nickel versus copper. Um, and uh, so we're having a lot of fun. This is unfortunately you can't calculate. We can make the measurement. We can do very simple um, comparison. For example, we can compare. This is a very complicated graph, but you'll be happy I'm almost done. That what it shows is comparing lifetimes measured by two photon photo emission with the lifetimes we measure with our attosecond RPs technique. And what it shows that for copper, you can have a single, um, this is a Coulomb matrix interaction that describes, let's say, the electron and electron interactions. And the same Coulomb matrix in, uh, value works all the way from the Fermi level up to these high photon energies we probe. Whereas with nickel, um, you have a very different um, Coulomb matrix interaction seen for excitations near the Fermi level. And whereas um, at high energy, we measure a value that's 1.8 that's very close to that of copper. So essentially, we think this method allows us to measure a bare um, Coulomb electron-electron interac -electron interaction in the absence of screening. And then these measurements at low photon energies near the Fermi, Fermi level essentially measure the presence of both screening and scattering. So we have a way of being able to separate screening and scattering between in electron-electron interactions, which is quite interesting. But it's it's, uh, and we can do that in a band-specific way, which is quite interesting from the point of view of calculating electron-electron interactions. So uh, we, we think we have kind of figured out a new types of spectroscopy that can distinguish electron-electron interactions, do it in a band-specific way, um, and hopefully uh, the interesting thing is that theorists actually calculated in a band-by-band -band in a spin uh, 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 in a spin-resolved formalism. So it might help uh, greatly in, in understanding electron, electron correlations. And that would be the hope. We'd be able to devise ways to be able to measure correlation. Um, and then there's a whole lot of other
practical types of measurements on magnetic systems, on mechanical systems that we we're able to make. This is our first um, time resolved movie. This is the simulation of heating a nanostructure followed by expansion and cooling. Um, the other techniques were all spectroscopies, but this is sort of taking imaging. What we'd really like to do is make a movie. And uh, this is our first little movie, just showing we can actually make a movie of a pillar being heated and then uh, cooling. This is a very crude movie for now, but it's, it's the first tabletop movie that where we can actually see a structure expanding and cooling. There's about three angstrom spatial resolution in the vertical direction where we have the phase image. Um, and there's prospect, all the uh, examples I showed used extreme ultraviolet light to, to wavelengths of about 13 nanometer. As we go to shorter wavelengths, we can penetrate thicker samples. There's a whole new generation of technology based on fiber lasers that will make these little compact microscopes and com compact synchrotrons more practical, and in, in particular because they have very high t um, spatial and temporal resolution capabilities. And with that, I'll, um, I know I've thrown a lot of physics at you today, and this is just the evening of the first day of the meeting, so we need to preserve some capacity. Now, um, our, my, our friends in physics education research say that you have 10 new topics per hour you can introduce and have the students be able to absorb. But you guys have been actually fantastic because you've asked a lot of really, really good questions. So I'm very impressed. And you know, thank you for coming this evening. And uh, I'm happy to answer any more questions. Thank you.